So um, yeah, I'm happy to give this presentation today and I changed it a little bit, uh, the title, and I called it instead of um, artificial intelligence in experiment, examples of artificial intelligence in experimental material science because there are so many of them and I won't be able to really give a complete overview, but at least a few examples. And I think they may help to um, then also have ideas of what else is possible and what else can be searched for and may already have been done. Um, I also want to put a disclaimer um, on this presentation. I'm coming from a background of experimental electromicroscopy. So I will focus mostly on examples in this area, but I think it's quite diverse. So there are still enough examples so that these can be then also translated to other areas, if you like. Um, then in addition, I, um, let's see, I will try to keep my chat open here and actually I will do this right now. So if you have a question, I will keep an eye on it um, and make sure that I see what you uh, want to comment on so that I can do this also in line. I will have a short break. That, so the talk will be split up, or the lecture will be split up in two parts so that there can also be a discussion in between. But if you feel like you want to bring up something right away, feel free to do so. And I will then uh, read out the question and then try to answer it as I, as I see it. Okay, let's start. Yeah, here's again um, what I said. I uh, this, this decided to split this in two parts, this lecture. And um, first I will give you a few ways of what, in, in which at least I found that uh, artificial intelligence is applied in experimental material science and, and can also actually help to, to support um, the scientists in discovery of new things. And then also how uh, artificial intelligence can be used to denoise data. I mean, in comparison to uh, theoretical calculations, we have a lot of noise often in our data and actually fighting noise, split, separating noise from the real signal is already a huge help. And actually artificial intelligence tools have helped in recent times to really move uh, by a large amount in this field. Then, of course, some classical applications of neural networks is classification, and I will uh, show you how this can also be done in material science and how this, um, these neural networks can not only separate cats from dogs or people from cars, but also um, help in material science applications. Um, and then also something that's very important and you have already learned about reg regularization in uh, fitting data um, and actually there is some issue with how strongly do you regularize and how do you find the right parameter and I will give uh, you some help on that as well. The part two will then be more examples of actual applications and uh, show you what has been done and how artificial intelligence tools have really been applied in various cases. Um, and then also coming back towards the very end to really also determining structures of materials. In this case, not crystals, but amorphous materials, but also finding atom positions. Um, so basically somehow preparing, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the topic of next week will be, but I read that it somehow wants to combine ab initio and experiment and somehow uh, preparing you a little bit in that direction again at least coming back to the atomic basis of materials. Let's start with the first point, different ways in which uh, artificial intelligence is applied in experimental material science. Well, there are these um, different categories and I just stole this graph here from Matthias's first lecture, reminding you again um, why I use this word artificial intelligence because it's um, an overarching theme or not, uh, it, it somehow is uh, the bigger set um, that contains then of course machine learning and also deep learning. And I will actually discuss each one of these, especially the deep learning. Um, I have an example for that I will show you, but um, the classical approach or the classical application um, that uh, machine learning has been in is not so much distinguishing 
um, or labeling, but it's um, actually denoising. So it has been done for decades already. Um, and that includes somehow separating the noise from the data in measurements where you have many very similar measurements that are composed of, for example, a linear composition of a few signals, um, but have added noise to them. And if you have a few thousands of these measurements and you want to somehow disentangle these two or three or whatever components you have from each other and from the noise, then these techniques that are in principle based on singular value decomposition, it's uh, finding in principle eigenvalues of matrices, um, but not of square matrices, but of uh, measurements that have uh, potentially many, many more measurements than the length of each measurement that you put in a matrix. Um, and based on these are also these uh, algorithms called principal component analysis and independent component analysis. It is in principle, uh, if you want a linear regression. So you have a signal that you know is composed of three components and you know the functional shape of these. Um, you can then find the contribution of each of these components in the signal. But if you don't really know what the uh, component is, actually that is where these tools come in. <clears throat> they distinguish the main components and sort them in principle by their strength. So the first few components that you get are usually then signal and the best of the components, they're typically then small, and you can think of it just like an eigenvalue decomposition of a matrix where the eigenvalues are sorted by their, by their magnitude so that the strongest eigenvalues are your signals and the other ones are the noise. And you decide that at some point, okay, let's just decide here is the border between actual components contributed to the signal and the rest is noise. And if you then just set them all to zero and recompose your matrix again, you have a cleaned up signal. So it's actually very simple, but you can call it machine learning because the machine has somehow learned the information, the underlying information from these measurements. Um, that is, has been uh, also named multivariate statistical analysis or MSA, and I will show you an example of that uh, later. It's a very common theme. And I think when I show you the example, it's, uh, it, it will be more, in, uh, yeah, more directly uh, understandable, I hope. Then of course, um, another approach of machine learning or artificial intelligence is the labeling of data. And um, so for example, um, when you want to uh, create something, uh, a material that has a certain property, you can have, high throughput experimental or combinatorial experiments where you actually test all different combinations of chemical substances and processing conditions and look what comes out, do some measurement on this. And once you have a huge set of data, you can feed that into an artificial neural network. And this can then try to optimize, um, it doesn't have to be an artificial neural network. It could be some other machine learning algorithm, but it tries to then optimize a certain property that you're after that you try to maximize using that database that you determine experimentally. So there has been, there have been several approaches um, that were quite successful um, already in this area. So um, if you like, you can, for example, read this review here and references that's given at the bottom and references therein um, if you are interested in how these approaches have already been uh, successful. But um, of course, there are also um, other uh, cases when you don't have a single experiment that produces all the data, but you now establish a database that collects information from all different labs that can produce similar data or even different data, but relating to the same material. That is a big challenge because then you have to deal with all the normalization of information and so on that um, Claudia Axel has talked about uh, when trying to uh, combine all the different theoretical um, calculations um, in experiments. It's even 
more complicated because it's more diverse and the data is not available in a digital format and so on. You have to work very hard to make that happen. But once you have that in principle, um, you can really have a huge gold mine of information that you can then uh, find properties in by applying these machine learning algorithms. Of course, the information should then be prepared as good as possible so that you have labeled information to work with. But uh, in addition, you can also then have realistic simulations of, oh, I'm realizing there's an R missing here, realistic simulations of experiments where you can treat the simulated data just like you would treat experimental data. And that then would actually help to make a link between the underlying structure, atomic or electronic structure, and the experimental data that you um, then simulate from it could be some kind of spectroscopy or an image or whatever. And then ha having all this in your database or having trained your artificial intelligence tool with this simulated information, you can then um, apply it to experimental data if the simulation was realistic um, and then interpret also experimental data using that. So there's different ways of going about this. And of course, it always depends on what you have available and what's possible. Um, the third option here is probably the cheapest one because um, there you don't have to do so many experiments, but often experiments are not so complicated. You can have actually thousands of them done uh, very quickly if you have one of these high throughput combinatorial um, experimental setups. These are the classical approaches that, in my opinion, um, these machine learning tools can be applied in experimental material science. But there are also additional uh, opportunities that go beyond this. And uh, one of this is um, really combining your artificial intelligence um, with some physical mechanism to make interpretations of your data so that the <laughs> In a generic artificial neural network, for example, does not know anything about physics, right? So when it tries to make a connection between your data and, for example, some structure that you want to determine from it, be it atomic or electronic, um, it doesn't know all the rules that we have in our mind that we would apply when we try to interpret this data. But you can augment the artificial neural network with such physical insight and really constrain it in that way to physically reasonable um, information. Um, there's actually examples of this mentioned given in that reference that um, I show at the bottom here. So if you're interested in that, um, there is something to follow up on. And, and of course, you can also have um, other innovative applications of artificial intelligence to derive scientific insight. Um, and that could even include uh, driving your experiment in an artificial manner, right? When I compare to this classical approach here of uh, high throughput combinatorial experiments, where you really test, you, you prepare your experiment and you say, okay, I want to test this phase space of options. Then of course um, you collect a lot of data, um, but a lot of this data is not really needed for anything because in that area where this data is collected, there is no interesting phenomenon to actually uh, go for. But you can actually include the artificial intelligence in the process of deciding how the experiment should go forth. And that is a very interesting approach. That's in principle like driving a car, right? So when a car is driven, the car wants to optimize in the process of this experiment of driving on a road. And it tries to avoid um, hitting people, hitting other cars and so on. And you could think of something similar also in experimental, in guiding the experiment to really um, go on an optimal path towards the goal that uh, you're after. And I will actually show you an example of this, um, how we apply this in the electron microscope. Um, well, I show an example of another group because our results are not published yet, but. Um, something uh, along the same line. Let's start very basic. So um, I like actually I like these plots here um, because they they show that there is really a lot of space and room for machine learning um, because when we 
try it when we have a, you know, the saying, when you have a hammer, everything becomes a nail, right? So when you have a linear equation, then um, of course it's easy or linear regression or so, it's easy to try to fit a line to all the data that you have, but oftentimes there, um, it's quite obvious that the line is not a good fit, like you can see here, for example. Um, but um, it's also not so easy to decide what it is, right? So you need to have a lot of statistical insight and so on, and a wise, sometimes also wise decision to decide why an experiment, for example, is an outlier like uh, this one here or this one uh, might potentially be, or maybe why it should be considered. Um, these four graphs, which is um, why uh, they're quite famous, they all have the same statistics. So they have, uh, they all fit exactly to the same line with the same chi-squared and also the standard deviation is all the same. So when you uh, um, produce the standard, standard deviation of the fit to the experimental data, or it's in this case, synthetic data, but um, to the data points, um, then they're all the same. But of course, they're all somehow strikingly different, right? So this, for example, the top right here, uh, linear fit doesn't seem to be ideal. Um, but it's easy in this case because these are one dimensional plots. Um, it's already a bit more complicated in, oops, in this case here, where you can see um, this is taken basically from a paper that went back to this original paper by Anscom. I showed you in the previous slide and tried to um, do this more advanced. And um, all these different point clouds here, they have the same standard deviation, they have the same also. Uh, mean values and also the, the co cross correlation or the correlation coefficient um, is always uh, the same, but um, there's of course an underlying structure. And this is also where machine learning can help. And this is also where we apply it in experimental science a lot, because if you have new experimental data and you try to gain insight um, into it, um, it sometimes helps to really uh, have a good relationship or like a, like a mathematical expression that can describe this data so that you can then work from it and uh, move forward. Like one example that comes to my mind is for example, how quantum, mechanic, how quantum mechanics was established, right? So um, it was this, this strange curve of the spectrum of the sunlight or any black body radiation that people had really scratched their head about and couldn't really explain. And Max Planck initially um, came and uh, just, yeah, said, okay, it has to describe a curve like this on one end and like this on the other end, let's find the mathematical expression that explains the complete curve. And of course, once he had this expression, he would then was then um, uh, tasked to somehow explain it. And then quantum mechanics in principle was born by having to assume these quanta and both Einstein statistics and so on. But um, it started with having a, an analytic expression that could explain the data. And this is also where machine learning can help us interpret our data. And one big aspect of this actually is denoising, right? Separating something that is obviously noise and that obeys also the noise statistics that we expect in the case when you detect particles like we do in electron microscopy, it is often Poisson statistics. But um, yeah, so separating the data from the noise is one very big aspect. And that's also why I will show you an example of that. Um, if you say machine learning, it's one big word. And of course, it means a lot of things. And if you've gone through this course until now, you have probably seen already a number of these. Um, we apply actually a few of these, at least four, if not more of, of these techniques in our group uh, in interpreting experimental data. I have, um, I'm highlighting now only three of these. So the first one is principal component analysis. I already mentioned to you, that is what um, I will show an example of. And then also, deep neural networks. Um, we uh, use those also to, to train our data. And of course, there are very different variants of this, right? So uh, one student in my group, for example, also uses recurrent uh, neural networks, but uh, I will just show you classical convolutional um, type of neural network. And then um, here on the bottom left, there's also this k-means algorithm, which is actually quite old. It's already from, um, the 60s and going back to roots in uh, 1957, 
but um, it's also a very interesting algorithm that can really be uh, used um, to extract information from experimental data that you wouldn't really see obviously by uh, the naked eye. Let's start with um, this application that I already mentioned now twice, um, and that is denoising um, experimental data. The basis for this is the singular value decomposition. So I mentioned this already. I told you it's something like um, eigenvalues of a matrix, except the matrix doesn't have to be square. But what you do is you separate your matrix M, which contains your measurements. And often um, uh, for this to work, you these measurements should be in columns, right? So you have many different um, measurements and you put them all into the columns of your matrix. These can be, um, I guess, very intuitively could be spectra, right? So a spectrum is a function, some intensity as a function of um, a one dimensional axis like energy or so. And you could put them all basically as columns in this matrix, but you can also take two dimensional data, images, diffraction patterns or whatever, and somehow uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the programming language, this, this is called flattening. You flatten it into a line, basically put all the numbers in one vector, and then you just keep adding those vectors. That means you have many, many of these measurements thousands, even millions. So when we um, collect electron microscopy data, what we apply this or what this is classically applied to is spectrum images. Spectrum images are when you have a map, um, let's say of a thousand by a thousand pixels and you collect a spectrum for each pixel going through basically these 1000 by 1000 positions. And then you have easily 1 million of these spectra. And then you separate them in this, in this way. You uh, basically have uh, separated in two matrices. And the important matrix that I want to focus on is the one here in the, in the center. It's the sigma matrix that contains now these singular values. Think of them as the eigenvalues of this matrix, um, except that, as I said before, the matrix is not square. But what's nice about the singular value decomposition is that these singular values are sorted in their magnitude. That means the strongest one is uh, S1, and then S2 is the next strongest, and so on. And this is a very useful property um, because you can then see, OK, my main components, these are the signals. They are basically S1 through, my, let's say, S5 or so. And everything else then somehow um, has very similar magnitude, but uh, small compared to the first ones. And what you then do is, you just set all the rest to zero. And by doing that, you ignore, of course, certain columns in these matrices, but um, the most important information is then preserved. So you, you basically set that, that implies that you set this information here to zero, these, these rows in B and these columns in U, but um, at the end, you have this reduced um, contribution. So these are now the strongest eigenvectors of this matrix. And these are the weights corresponding. And these are the eigenvalues that link them. And you then have a cleaned up matrix in principle. That means you still have a matrix with the same number of measurements and also the length is the same, but the noise has been subtracted everywhere because um, you set all these contributions of the noise. If you can really nicely separate it like that to zero. Let me show you an example. Um, this is uh, taken from this paper here. It's, um, it's a spectrum, it's an EELTS uh, spectrum image. So that means here now the beam was positioned to all these different positions um, going across the sample, collecting an EELTS spectrum everywhere. And um, you then do this analysis. And if you look at the first component, it is the average spectrum. So that's, that's um, this one here. This is always the average. That means the average of all these spectra. And of course, this doesn't look very noisy because if you average over all these spectra, you average away the noise. The second component already, you can see it has a bit more noise and uh, it's plotted on an arbitrary scale. So you don't see it very much, but you can see it already makes a distinction um, between, so you have some positive and some negative contribution here. Um, but 
So that means if you have if you have more of this, that means right here where it's bright, you have more of this signal. That means you add to the average here and you subtract from the second peak because here the second peak is uh, negative, right? So this, this bump here is reduced. And that helps you then to separate between these different, uh, this different phases in this yield spectrum, um, or let's say different states. In, in this case, um, we are at 285 EV, that is this peak here, so it's carbon spectrum, and you can then distinguish between different coordinations of carbon in this case. Right, and um, but it really helps to then also um, when you, uh, yeah, you, you can see this is this this is this average spectrum here, um, and if you look down here, here you see actually the the noise is still in there, and this is how you see you really gain by uh, reducing or yeah reducing the noise in in the data by ignoring these additional components in your singular value decomposition. Let me show you another example. Oops. Ah, somehow it didn't go the way I wanted, but um, it's okay. Um, I, I will change it in a little bit. Um, but here you can see there is, um, these are now spectrum images of um, elemental maps. So not only basically on the carbon loss, but focusing on titanium and iron and aluminum in this material here. Um, it's taken from this paper that um, is linked down here by Masashi uh, Watanabe uh, from Lehigh University. And if you recall all these spectra and you try to then you set a window, what you do is if you say this, for example, this is a carbon um, signal, then you set a window and you integrate everything that's within this carbon window. And you say, that is my carbon signal. And you do this for all the different signals that you have, titanium, iron, and aluminum in this case. And if you plot um, this titanium, for example, it has very good signal because it has a very strong signal. And also because there's a lot of titanium in this material. But when you go to um, contributions that are weaker in, con in their weight percentage, for example, iron, is there's not so much iron in this material. You can see that the noise increases quite a bit. And if you go to aluminum, it increases even further. But if you do this denoising that I just mentioned, um, you can actually separate these noise components from these ac actual elemental contributions. And you can see that these signals here are now um, recovered with much better signal to noise ratio, especially for this aluminum where the contribution is only 3%, it looks much better. And if you go to niobium, which has even lower concentration, you can see here where it has a very low concentration, you would not be able to see much at all, but applying this denoising um, using this principal component analysis um, really helps to improve uh, the signal. Then, um, as I mentioned, um, we also want to look at the classification of images using convolutional neural networks. Um, convolutional neural networks are something that um, you have heard about already, but uh, let me just give you a quick, um, this picture here of, of neural networks. Um, convolutional neural networks, that's um, one, it's this line here. So you have, um, and this is a convolutional neural network and this is a deep convolutional network. That means you have multiple layers, um, but you can see it's uh, only one of many, many options. And convolutional networks are really used to uh, work with images. So two-dimensional images where, for example, like this, right? That is in principle what your self-driving car does when it interprets pictures and um, tries to label things, whether um, there's a stop sign in this picture or not and where the stop sign is and so on. Um, but these networks, they always need data. So you need to have somebody, some voluntary people to label tons of data to really allow you for to to have something to feed your network on that is in principle a big shortcoming of this approach and um, that's also what this cartoon here tries to actually um, explain um, right but you, you've seen this lecture by angelo ziletti already on convolutional neural networks so i won't explain much about them at all 
except for um, saying that it takes advantage of neighboring pixels, of the configuration of neighboring pixels. So it has a special connectivity that is somehow two dimensional, right? So you always, in the first layers, you always link pixels that are neighbors to each other in both X and Y and not only in one direction. And um, you then do further convolutions and so on and so on until you can, for example, classify uh, crystal structures from diffraction patterns as he has provided in his lecture. Here's another example of this that um, is the identification and labeling of experimental images of different microstructures. So this um, is experimental work um, that um, was done in Trieste in Italy. And um, what they had is they had 20,000 images that were all collected on the same instrument. And that means all this data, of course, was prepared in the same way, had uh, the labels were all the same. So these were in principle identical images in terms of the metadata that uh, came with it. So the magnification and so on was easy to read out because it was stored in all these images the same way. And again, this is where this um, idea of having a big database and normalizing data and so on that the NOMAD project uh, pursues uh, comes in. So um, that is one benefit that they had and they had 20,000 or 22,000 images to train this network and it was then able to uh, from labeled data. And so they spent a long time labeling data. That means identifying these um, uh, 10 different categories and assigning them to each of the pictures. They were able to then uh, have the network identify additional images and label them according to these categories. In the meantime, uh, Stefano Corsini, who, who here's the guy who actually is um, the lead person on this uh, neural network activity, they have also trained unsupervised uh, convolutional neural networks, which somehow found then categories and identified them. And some of these categories were actually identical with some of the ones that they had labeled. Of course, there was no name assigned to them, but there was a category. And in this category, all the images, for example, looked like these uh, looked like fibers. And then only somebody had to then afterwards come in and assign, okay, that is called fiber now or something else. And of course that is much easier. And that is the way that uh, these uh, convolutional networks and labeling of uh, data in material science becomes um, a very big help because it helps to identify data and uh, from, from a large amount of data that you wouldn't be able to manually screen. But um, on, on how to identify, uh, how to basically get data from different sources together and so on, I refer to other talks um, that um, I don't have the time to go into this topic. But I just wanted to uh, finish with um, talking about one of these convolutional networks. And this is um, actually for this, what I just mentioned, um, having a system that can automatically, so unsuper in an unsupervised manner, identify different groups in your images. One of these encoder decoder networks is actually quite useful. So you have these input images and you do some convolutions with them and you do some max pooling. Um, I believe Angelo Zilletti has already explained to you how this all works. And um, you further then reduce it to a sh rather short vector which contains then in principle all these different labels and you go back up and try to then match that to your images again. And um, that is how these encoders and decoders are trained and then find somehow categories. And there is a special version of this, which is called the UNet that um, has also these skip connections where you also, basically in, in this step here, when going from, for example, this one to, up sampling again to the bigger image, you combine it also with this straightforward propagated information from your original uh, highly resolving version of the images. And you do that in all these different levels. And this actually has increased the performance. So the convergence of this very much, 
and it allows you to do applications. So this has been developed in the field of um, bio, um, yeah, medical imaging. Um, and, and here you can see cells. Uh, this is a differential phase contrast uh, image of cells and then labeling these cells, identifying basically what is a cell, where are the boundaries between cells and so on. Uh, this is where this is actually very much applied and very successful. And we have actually looked at, at this ourselves um, and wanted to improve on that even further. But let me just show you what you need for this. You actually need quite a large set of data again, or the unit says it works with less data than competing approaches, which is very good. But this is the kind of training data, right? So you get these, uh, this is one of these standard data sets that people have used. This comes from electron microscopy of, uh, in the life, life science field, and you have these images and you somehow assign them to a label um, that you have. So if somebody has manually identified the boundaries between these cells and what the neural network is now trained to do is making that connection between actual images and these uh, segmented images and trying to then ultimately do the segmentation by itself. Uh, one recent uh, publication that from our group um, or contribution to this field, let's put it this way, was um, to then have also in addition to these connections here between, um, so these skip forward uh, connections is to also really train the, the low resolution versions of this um, to agree with low res resolution versions of our training images. And um, this has really helped to then improve the convergence even further so that you can uh, reduce your, your loss uh, much quicker with uh, less training uh, iterations or epochs as it's called. But that's in principle one modification to it. And let me just show you a few, a few fun uh, applications of this. So here is <laughs> um, the student who has done that. Um, he took his laptop, you can see here his laptop and he mounted it in front of a regular door and now filmed this fuzzy image of the screen. So this picture that you can see here, you don't see much, but it's enlarged here. So this is a, the, a scene from this movie. And this is basically what you see on the door, right? You don't really recognize very much, but because now you have this training data and the observation, so the, the training data contains the original, the ground truth and this observation in reflection. You can take all these different reflected images here and recover then what should have been in there. Um, this is now the test data, of course, not the training, but you can see it, it's not quite the ground truth because some details are just unrecoverably um, lost, but it can recover quite a lot of information. And that is what these neural networks can really be used for in uh, terms of denoising experimental data and um, also not only denoising, but also recovering information, solving, for example, physical equations, right? So here are defocused images of cells. Um, these are not ones that we acquired. We have similar ones, but um, these can be actually downloaded. So this is a publicly available data set. Um, you can go to this publication down here to look it up. But um, these uh, images here, you can see only the boundaries, and but these boundaries, of course, are related to the change in refractive index within the cell. Um, and you only see these boundaries actually being highlighted. And now taking only, for example, two images, um, this neural network that was trained to solve this inversion of the Laplacian. In principle, these images here are some kind of the La version of the Laplacian of these phase images. Taking only two images, you can actually already get quite a good estimate of this reconstruction. And this is basically a reconstruction that takes all these images into account with another algorithm I won't go into, but just taking, for example, a single image already was able um, to recover something that looks not so bad. Actually, this one here looks better, but you can see uh, these neural networks, they can really, when they have a lot of training data, can really um, recover also or do a reconstruction of a physical process that um, somehow hides information within the data that you collect experimentally. And let me stop with this one. And then we have a short break. Um, 
And this is now a fuzzy image, or not a fuzzy image, it's noisy image of stem of atoms. So these are on amorphous carbon and uh, it's, it's platinum atoms that uh, somehow make small clusters. And the question is, what does this cluster look like? Where are the atoms? Um, it's difficult to actually to tell from this image, but if you can model this noise, um, in this, this noisy process and simulate from, from true ground truth images that you simulate from where the atoms are, and you can simulate this process of becoming more noisy, you can train in your network with these pairs of images and then go also the way backwards. So that means from this observation, you can go back to something like the ground truth in this case and find the atom positions. And also um, in this case where the atoms are a bit more spread out, you can also identify these atoms. For example, here there's, you would guess there is an atom somewhere, but yet in, indeed, and the algorithm does find, for example, an atom out there. And of course, all the other ones as well. But with that, let me have a short break and welcome questions, if you have any. Well, if there are no questions immediately from the students, I would like to ask one. So in, uh, in the case of denoising with uh, singular value decomposition, one could relate that denoising with the more naive denoising of making a, a kernel smoothing uh, approach, for instance, you know, kernel smoothing would be you go through the data and you average on a, on a certain range. Uh, uh, and you can make this average with a weighted kernel, let's say. Yeah, so, so one, uh, one standard way that we do with images actually is Fourier filtering. That's right? awesome. So you take, you take the Fourier transform yep. and you then reduce the range of spatial frequencies to a smaller range and you inverse Fourier transform again. And that has exactly this effect. Mm -hmm. You do some local averaging, yes. Mm -hmm. So but, why would you choose one over the other? Yeah, actually, I didn't show you. Actually, this paper compares them. So this paper shows the Fourier filtered version. That means local averaging, like what you call kernel averaging. Um, and it compares this reconstruction. And the local averaging doesn't look so much better because you cannot average too much because you want to keep the atomic resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I have a question? Yes. Because I, ca I cannot raise my hand because I'm um, a co-host. Uh, on, on this denoising also, uh, I mean, how safe or how dangerous is that? So, so what I have always in mind is somewhat um, the quantum Hall effect by, by Klaus von Klitzing. Uh, I mean, the peaks he have seen, many people had seen before, but actually they were in the noise and, and, and people really felt that they're part of the noise. So, um, so, even so, so, so with natural intelligence, you had a problem in identifying it. Uh, is artificial intelligence better or even worse? It depends on how you program it and how open you are about um, the way you did it. Um, I, you know, but if you don't know the effect, right? I mean, this yeah. is this this was the point that nobody expected something there. Mm -hmm. So I, to be honest, I didn't go into the details of Klaus von Klitzing's um, discovery of the quantum Hall effect, but um, I can only speak for microscopy at, in, at this place right now. Um, and what I would like to say is we, in principle, know the statistics of our data because it's um, Poisson statistics. So we know when we have, let's say, 100 counts, um, we know what the noise distribution should look like. And we can design also the loss function for our training um, to really take this Poisson statistics into account. And then we can say what is significant and what's not significant. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work and one really has to be careful about this and know what one is doing, but it is um, not impossible, let's put it this way. And you, you, can, you can at least have some, of course, it's not 100%, but you can have some statistical significance on whether this is a peak or not. And then you can decide on these numbers, but it's better than um, reading the coffee sets. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, let me continue with the next point uh, from this part one. Um, I thought to have a break a little bit before the end of part one, and then we go immediately into part two. Um, and that is the determination of regularization parameters. You have hopefully watched this uh, very 
um, instructive lecture by Santiago Rigamonti um, on regularization. And uh, in particular, here is the example of L1 regularization, which really helps to find sparse solutions. And that is really the basis for compressed sensing, which I will also mention uh, later on. But um, one thing that you need to determine in this, in, in this regularization is how strongly do you regularize? Um, that means, what do you make this parameter lambda here? Um, if you make it too strong, you will in principle have not a good fit to your data anymore. If you make it too weak, then you run into this danger of overfitting. That means um, the noise is being fitted and this regularization has no effect. And the question is, where do you set the, the right uh, value for lambda? And one way of doing this, um, not only in the context of uh, compressed sensing, but in the context of regularizing other data, and that's already um, been known for a long time, and that is the so-called L-curve, right? This type of regularization that um, you, you saw in the previous slide is called Tikhonov regularization, where you have um, your cost function um, that relates to the agreement between your modeled data that uh, is derived from the experiment, from, from the parameters that you want to fit and your experiment. And that is typically the L2 norm of the difference between experiment and forward model. Um, and then you have um, this, this other term that is your regularization term. In this case, it's the two norm, not the L1 norm, but um, that is, uh, can be exchanged. And if you now do different reconstructions, that means or different fits to your data with different values of lambda, you can plot on a log log curve the, the two terms. So once the residual, um, that means the agreement with experiment, and then also the regularization term, and you can um, plot them uh, separately. That means as a function of the residual, you plot the regularization term, and it typically follows this type of L shape. Um, and for different values of lambda, you can see them here very small, so they often have to be changed over several orders of magnitude from 10 to the minus five, in this case up to two. And if you do the regularization too strongly, uh, sorry, too weakly, that means here the lambda is too small, um, in this case here, this, this is where the lambda is 0.03. So that's, um, that's this value here. You can see that the, the truth, the ground truth is this, um, this, this light curve in the background and you're fitting mostly the noise in the data. If you make your regularization too strong, then you don't fit, this is the actual curve that you want to fit. And this is what your model then predicts. That means you don't fit the noise anymore, but also your regularization term here, um, has, the lambda was too strong. So the value became too small. That means the numbers that you fit are too small. So you uh, have to actually do this, repeat this model fitting for different um, settings of lambda. And if you do it right, then you can actually get a good fit to your, to your data. That means you ignore enough of the noise and you um, don't restrict your solution too much. And that is um, a, an art often. What do you set as parameter? And this is actually one way of finding it out um, using this L curve or one simple and easy way that um, doesn't require much programming. It just requires changing the parameter and redoing the fit. Now let me come to the applications um, where actually we take um, many of the things that I've shown you in the part one, um, actually apply them to electron microscopy. I already showed you one example of, for example, finding atoms from a noisy image, but um, let me show you additional ones. So the electron microscope um, that is uh, shown here looks in principle like an optical microscope. You have a source and you somehow have electrons that go through the sample and you can then collect diffraction patterns or images depending on how you adjust the lens current in these electromagnetic lenses. And one experiment uh, you can do is you can focus your electron beam to the sample and have then these convergent beam diffraction patterns. So you have a, a convergent beam. That means it 
somehow converges on the sample and you illuminate only a very small area. This can be smaller than one angstrom. Actually, um, in this case, you would make it a bit bigger than one unit cell, but anyway, you get a diffraction pattern or you can also then collect yields spectra from it. And that is what I will show you both of these examples. So collecting these diffraction patterns and also collecting, for example, yield spectra here. And you can then apply machine learning to these different types of experimental data that we acquire. Here is one example of one of these convergent beam electron diffraction patterns. They're actually visually very appealing because there's a lot of symmetry that you can find in here or asymmetry and that reflects then the symmetries of your crystal structure. And it's uh, very interesting, um, but uh, let me, let me uh, move on. But what people can do is um, they, they can take these patterns and try to fit them with a simulation or, um, and this is something called PACBED, so it's position average seabed. So you have basically uh, these diffraction patterns I showed you, and you now move the beam around on your sample and average over different positions relative to the unit cell so that you get something that is independent of where your probe is on the unit cell. And you can then design a network in your part. Uh, uh, yeah, this is a fully connected neural network where you try to fit um, different parameters, in particular, the thickness of the sample and also the tilt of the sample. Um, that means how, what the beam, what is the orientation of the electron beam relative to the zone axis of your uh, crystal. And um, what, this is work done by Jim Lebo, not, not by us, but um, he is at um, Ohio and um, has been able to find uh, basically the tilt and also the thickness of the sample, knowing already the crystal structure um, and doing that, uh, for example, with one of these convolutional neural networks. So first you have a few layers of convolution pooling, convolution pooling and further convolution and pooling. And then often because you want to reduce this to only in this case, three parameters. So the thickness is one and the tilt has two dimensions. So tilt and X, and tilt and y. So you want to have three parameters. That means you do some fully connected uh, layers. This is a very, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very generic way of constructing these convolutional networks when you try to extract parameters from the experiment. And then at the end, of course, you have a nonlinear activation function. That is actually what makes it an artificial neural network. If you don't have that, I've been told you can have as many, um, neural network constructions as you do, but without this nonlinear activation function, you shouldn't be calling it an artificial neural network. But anyway, um, that, that is one approach of doing this and they were quite successful in doing that. And they found out, of course, the neural network really helps. And that is one of the things that I want to point out uh, citing this work, it helps finding a core solution, but it, it doesn't beat um, one of the, regular optimization techniques that just goes downhill. So they, and they combined them. They had first this neural network to give them a course solution and then refine the solution that they had further to then get to the accurate uh, numbers that they uh, uh, put in as training data. And then they were able to um, find these values quite accurately. Here is another example of um, yields spectra. So I showed you we can either collect diffraction patterns or we can take a spectrum of the electrons that have passed through the sample. And um, one of the applications of yields is which something like EDX, which is collecting X-ray emitted from the sample cannot do. And this application of yields is identifying different coordination numbers of an atom. So you can, uh, of course, you, you find where the energy, so there's an energy axis below this that is not shown here in this picture, but um, this peak here is, is at a particular energy loss. And you can, of course, use that information to identify the species. In this case, um, it's manganese. Um, and then you want to, look at the features in this yield spectrum, and that helps you then to find the coordination of this. It's possible as a well-trained spectroscopist to really identify these features and say, oh, yeah, if the spectrum looks like this, 
somehow like this. Um, it of course can deviate a little bit depending on the thickness of the sample, the orientation of the beam relative to the sample and so on. It's manganese two. And if this intensity, the relative intensity between these two peaks increases, it's manganese three, or it's a bit difficult to decide when, uh, sorry, um, this is um, this should be four plus here. The bottom one should be four plus. It's a, I, I apologize for this mistake. This one here is three and this one should be four plus. Uh, but it's difficult to decide when um, there's actually uh, the, um, make, let me make sure that it's a four plus. It's difficult to decide when it's the, the, the coordination of three because it's somehow in between these two extrema. And this is where the neural network can really help to make uh, this decision and also give you some quantitative information with it in saying basically it's uh, with that certainty, it's coordination three and not four or not two and so on, right? So this is how you can apply and how people have applied it. I said, I would present a few examples, um, classification, for example, on spectra, on these uh, type of yield spectra. Then, of course, not of course, but one interesting application that uh, brings us or has actually brought us into this field of um, looking into artificial neural network is inverse problems. So you have an experiment, um, and in our case, it's some atomic structure that diffracts, produces a diffraction pattern, could also be an yield spectrum like we've seen in the previous slide, but it produces some experimental observation but we don't know what the atomic structure is. And now we want to recover this atomic structure from the experimental observation. And that is what we call an inverse problem. And that is actually what we have uh, focused on quite a bit of effort in, uh, in solving these inverse problems, um, making some progress uh, little by little. But um, here is, how this uh, can really help and how we can really use these artificial neural network structures to help solve this problem that we are interested in. Let me explain to you how electron scattering or electron imaging in the microscope works. So we have an electron beam that uh, shines on our sample and the sample is thick, let's say 10 nanometers or maybe 100 nanometers thick which um, seems small to you, but for electrons, this is a lot because they scatter very quickly and very, like they scatter about five orders of magnitude more strongly than X-rays, depending on energy, of course, but um, you can see it, a very small sample will already lead to multiple scattering. And um, that is what happens. So this electron comes in and it scatters in the first layer. And this is basically what this, uh, how this is modeled. You, you separate your, three-dimensional electrostatic potential into layers, and you, you compress these layers into two dimensions. You have uh, scattering in this layer of potential, and then you have free space propagation, which is described by uh, the solution of the Schrodinger equation. It's in principle just Fresnel propagation. You, maybe you remember that from optics. Um, and then you have a next layer where you have scattering, and then the wave function is modified, and then it's again further propagated and so on. And you do this, through the whole sample. And if you've listened to these uh, talks on artificial neural networks and deep neural networks already, you may realize that this is exactly what a neural network does. So you have some input and you have um, these different uh, weights here and you have these nodes connecting them and so on. You can really write, rewrite this multiple scattering formalism into an, a deep neural network. And what you put in, you put in your incident wave function, just what we indicated here by this red arrow, and out comes a picture or a diffraction pattern, whatever you detect on your detector. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And this propagation here is just this Fresnel propagation that is described here. So it's really that we already know what this propagation looks like. So we know the connections between the nodes and um, how they have to be weighted, but we don't know what's inside of them. We only know what we send in and what we observe here. 
So what we then do is we take these observations. So we take multiple observations of the same sample and then train this neural network with back propagation forward and back and forward and back until it's trained. But then we don't use this neural network to predict new measurements, but we, as you want, maybe you can, we actually look inside. We look inside what actually has it learned. We cut open the brain of this neural network and take the values. And these represent directly our model, our atomic potential, our three-dimensional electrostatic potential of the sample. So that is one way of doing this. And here you can see an example. And this was already done in 2012, but we have more recent um, cases of this. And now we uh, do this also experimentally, but this is only in simulation. Um, when taking uh, these two nanoparticles, uh, they have random orientations to each other and you tilt them by plus minus 10 degrees. So this is not tomography, right? When you do tomography, you want to tilt by plus minus 70 or even plus minus 90, but tilting only a little bit, plus minus 10 degrees and taking observations of each of these and doing that also in the other direction, um, it's possible to then recover really the three-dimensional potential. And this only really works because we've been able to use L1 regularization. So we know the shape of each atom and deconvolving the shape of each atom, we expect that there is basically a delta function at the position of the atom. That means this electrostatic potential is, or this deconvolved electrostatic potential is zero in most places, but has a few peaks where the atoms sit. And um, this allows us to then also solve an underdetermined problem um, and applying basically this L1 regularization. And again, of course, you have to now do this L curve to find which weight should be given to this uh, regularization parameter. And you can also use some other methods to find that. But um, I just wanted to say that is always something that you have to be aware of when you use regularization that you give it um, the correct weight. Now, just one slide on how this can also be done, because of course you can write this neural network in a very flexible manner. You can now do any kind of operation on this and uh, what we apply this more recently to, and this is now also on experimental data, moving this probe around the sample, collecting different diffraction patterns, not tilting the sample, but keeping the sample in the same place, but moving the probe around on the sample and having then that way more than one diffraction pattern. And um, this allows you really to go to very high uh, resolution uh, in the reconstruction. Um, when you know there have to be atoms, you can uh, use that information to really point out where they are. It's a bit like, you know, the super resolution microscopy techniques and optical microscopy like STED and POM and so on. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but they can also get, um, let's say 20 nanometer or even less than 20 nanometer down to close to one nanometer spatial resolution with a wavelength um, that is in, uh, in the hundreds of nanometers. So uh, you can, by having a model that takes into account the shape of the atoms, you can actually point out their positions very accurately to picometer precision. Um, let me just have two little more examples. Um, one is um, a very recent one actually of a master thesis that is being defended um, today, this, this afternoon. Um, here's an image of, it's, a, it's not an image actually, sorry, it's, it's, a, it's the phase of the electron wave function that has been recovered from a focal series of images. So images have been acquired with different defocus and what we then do uh, routinely is we reconstruct the electron wave function that has scattered through the sample. That means recovering both its amplitude and also its phase. And the phase of this wave function is directly proportional to the projected electrostatic potential of this material. So in principle, when we recover this potential, we can count how many atoms there are and where they are and so on. Uh, here, it's a bit complicated because the resolution doesn't allow us to actually identify the position of every atom, but we see something that is a very, yeah, it, it looks actually like noise. If you didn't know that um, this would be a real signal and this was recovered from multiple measurements, uh, you would think, ah, oh, you just collected some noise here. 
But, and this is now the master thesis of Konstantin Skutler, um, what he has done is he has recovered a three-dimensional set of atom positions from this model, uh, from, from this data, from only this one picture here, a three-dimensional set of atom positions of the, basically a model of this amorphous material. It's amorphous uh, glass, so it's, sorry, it's a metallic glass um, having basically two species of atoms in it, um, zirconium and um, I think it's platinum. And uh, these metallic glasses have extreme mechanical properties um, that I won't get into. So there is a lot of interest in these glasses recently. Um, but it's therefore also interesting to find out what are the structural units, the structural units of the amorphous material that makes up uh, this material. And for this, we have different ways of doing that. So another uh, student is also doing this with the fraction and will hopefully also soon defend his thesis. But this is now working on uh, these images. And so what Konstantin was able to do is he was able to construct this three-dimensional model of, uh, of this material that corresponds to that uh, image. And um, if you then simulate the image from that, so we take these atom positions and we simulate again the projected potential, it looks like this. So you can see a lot of um, things that are very similar. So you can see a few dark spots here that correspond to each other um, and these two dark spots. So a lot of features are similar, but they're not exactly the same. And in principle, it would be quite straightforward um, to really find an, an atom model, atomic model that is very much the same and it looks very close to the experimental data. However, um, this model was also constrained in terms of the structural units that it was made up of. And that's and this constraint somehow, of course, leads to, as I've said before, um, you don't fit the data absolutely, right? So you have to make a compromise between um, satisfying the constraint and fitting the experimental data. And this constraint was based on um, this, what I show here, it's this smooth overlap of atomic potential of atomic positions that allows you to describe the local atomic, the local environment around an atom with a matrix in principle. That means you have uh, different coefficients that you fit here. That's basically these. Uh, C coefficients, you fit them to the local environment. Basically, you have you, you construct a smooth overlap of these atomic potentials and you expand this in terms of spherical harmonics and radial functions. And the what the very important feature of this is that you have a, a descriptor at the end that is rotationally invariant. That means um, you if you rotate your three-dimensional structure, you will get the same descriptor. And that is important in amorphous materials because amorphous materials don't have, like crystals, do this um, directional preference, but the structural units are assumed to be randomly oriented. And so now we can, for each atom, describe its structural unit, or it's, it's sorry, not its structural unit, but it's, its uh, local atomic environment in terms of this descriptor. And, where it now comes in what I said in the heading here, compressed sensing. So the idea is now to sparsify the solution in terms of these structural units. That means um, reduce the number of distinct structural units to as many as it can find. And now we can really come back to the very beginning of this lecture where I told you about this denoising using singular value decomposition. And that does exactly that. So singular value decomposition separates um, the, the different components that you can find in your data. And then the rest is all noise. And by and this actually was uh, work in the bachelor thesis of uh, Tim Bechtel, who is also in the audience here. Um, he actually found a way how singular value decomposition or how you can apply the L1 norm to singular value decomposition to actually then come up with a sparse number of singular values that um, then really reduce the number of distinct features uh, in this 
in, in the structural material. And um, applying that um, basically as a constraint to where the atoms have to be put in this three-dimensional model to at the same time fit the experimental data and also uh, satisfying the sparsity constraint. Um, then Konstantin came up with uh, a solution that allowed uh, a three-dimensional model to be built that fits the experimental data, but also has only a few structural units. And one thing that uh, he did in addition to using this um, singular value decomposition, one other algorithm is also what's also mentioned in here, and that is uh, the, the k-means algorithm, which clusters your data. And um, that is in principle what's shown here. So in addition to using this uh, singular value, sparsifying the singular value decomposition, um, he also tried sparsifying um, or minimizing the what's called momentum or the inertia, sorry, the inertia in uh, of this k-means cluster algorithm, which is uh, basically this number here. So the k-means algorithm identifies clusters within your phase space. So this is multidimensional, not just two-dimensional. That's why I cannot show a picture of it here. But imagine you had two parameters and you put them in this parameter space and what it tries to find, it tries to find groups, which when you take the average of that group, all the members of that group are as close as possible to the average. And that is exactly what is shown here. So you minimize in principle this expression here. And, but that expression gives you already what's called the inertia. That is in principle the chi-squared difference of each of the member of a group to its average. And if you minimize them, then within each group, the, the features become more and more similar, right? And that is a good way to, a good thing to optimize when you try to make these structural units in the amorphous material as similar as possible. In this case, in this material, in this glass, he found six, six of these structural units. Sorry, that's already displayed. Yeah, he found six. I only showed three here. Um, and they differ in radio distribution function and in the distribution of uh, bond angles and so on. Um, and you can really classify them that way at the end. Anyway, um, let me uh, step to the last point. Um, I showed, I said in the very beginning when I said um, in this first point here that there are different ways that artificial intelligence can contribute to material science, that there's also a way that, that artificial intelligence can be used to uh, guide your experiment or even drive your experiment and um, find an optimal path in acquiring the data. And this is the last thing that I want to uh, mention now uh, very quickly. I won't go into our own efforts on this because they're not published, but uh, in half a year, I would, this would be different, but um, not at this point yet. So I refer to work that is done at Warwick University. Um, and I come back to this scheme where we have a sample and we position, this is this tychography or 4D stem technique, where we position the beam to many locations on the sample. And we then collect diffraction patterns at the end. And we try to recover this, uh, the picture that is observed by this. It can also be done by not collecting the complete diffraction button, but, but uh, doing ADS stem. That means you collect, um, you, you make, uh, you integrate over this diffraction pattern, over a certain range of this diffraction pattern, for example, an annulus. And uh, you treat that then as one number that corresponds to this one beam position. The way that is normally done is uh, if you follow my laser pointer, so you start in the top left corner and you move right and you fly back and you take the next line and you then record the next line. It's in principle like these old CRT uh, displays, um, uh, these cathode ray tube uh, displays uh, that you may still be uh, remembering. But um, actually the old microscopes were even built that way. So they, they had two of these. So one was in the microscope, there was the electron beam recording the data. And the other one was um, basically going synchronized, uh, displaying the intensity that was measured on a, on a CRT. And that is how these first pictures were displayed. And the recording was then done by taking a Polaroid camera, pointing it at the screen and taking a picture of that. And that is how the first microscope images in these STEM setups 
were recorded. Um, I was still using one of those when, as a as a student. But anyway, um, so but that is not the most dose efficient way. So dose is number of electrons per area, and many samples don't withstand too many electrons per area. So there has been a lot of interest in optimizing the deacquisition scheme. So going away from this line by line acquisition, but moving the beam in uh, random patterns, for example. So putting the beam in random positions and then using this compressed sensing uh, scheme to still recover the complete image. As you may know, JPEG images, they are represented by only uh, like, uh, for example, uh, these, I don't know, four megapixel or even 10 megapixel, or now you have like several hundred or 100 megapixel cameras in modern uh, cell phones. Um, if you save those images, they're still only a few megabytes large, right? So you don't even spend one byte per pixel, even though they're colored pictures. Um, and that is because you use this compressed sensing. You find a space where you can really sparsify this information and then store the picture in, in that case, it's uh, wavelets, but uh, the same principle people want to apply also to these uh, STEM pictures. And the idea is to not even record everything, but record already in a sparse manner. And that is would be, uh, for example, going around um, on, on a path um, that is not the classical one. But And here, machine learning and people have actually used and recurrent neural networks. Um, and they are also used in optimizing how machines, for example, move or perform certain tasks. And that is you learn by experience. You optimize along the way of doing the experiment. And that is something um, that has led them, despite basically uh, this path that you can see here. So this, it, it goes very weird um, and not really in the classical manner, but it's basically been optimized so that um, the picture that they were able to record even though they have not recorded everything here, um, looks already quite close to the ground truth, right? And this is something that is really a, a, a very active field. It's very recent. So this um, is actually not even a published paper. This is a website of somebody basically displaying the progress of his work. Um, and our work is also not published yet, but I just wanted to point out um, artificial intelligence can do more than just processing and denoising data. It can even help to drive your experiment. And with that, I come to my conclusion, um, basically saying what I've said along the lines um, throughout the talk, um, classical applications of machine learning are denoising data, classifying images, spectra, whatever experimental data you have. Um, and um, of course, you can go all the way to really having AI drive your experiment and optimizing, in our case, it's those, in other cases, it would be speed or whatever of your experiment. And some points uh, in between that I mentioned, um, if you regularize uh, your data fitting, um, there are ways to really find out what are optimal um, parameters for the regularization. And also very interestingly, maybe on the side, that some physical experiments can really be directly represented by an artificial neural network. And with that, I take more questions. I have one question. What about predicting the noise or, or the error in, in uh, no, uh, still not measured data? What, what about predicting the error in still not measured data? Yes, because uh, somehow when you uh, denoise, you are somehow subtracting some measure error. That that means that you are able to to estimate that error in a in a given sample. So you could, for instance, uh, th th there are also methods to to say, okay, if I want to improve my my database to add new data to my database, yep. uh, at, at least in in calculations, you you can also find find out ways to reduce the to find out what what is the sample that would reduce the most the the error of my fit, you know that this, this is a, this is called a variance reduction method that mm -hmm. would tell you which sample to add to to reduce the the the, the learning error. Um, in the context of 
what which which of the contexts do you refer to right now? That, so having an AI driven okay, experiment. Let, let, let me reformulate. If you are building a, a, a database of experimental data, okay. maybe you want to know okay which uh, new samples would make sense to add to my database. So uh, maybe this is a valid question to to say okay here one can apply machine learning. Yeah. to know which data would help me to reduce my overall error. Yeah. Well, that, that's an interesting question. Of course, um, when you want to read, when the goal is to reduce the overall error, you already have a model and you try to then include that in the model. Um, that is, okay, I would have to think about it. Um, in a more general context, I would think if I just collect data and I uh, wait with building the model until I have more data, but the question is also how do I determine how reliable the data is, right? In um, in our we okay in, in physics, let's put it this way, or more <laughs> experimental physicists, um, they always think they have the ground truth, and people doing simulations, calculations, they have a model that needs to at least uh, that it needs to somehow at one point reach this ground truth. So from an experimentalist point of view. The goal is to make the data itself as reliable as possible, right? And there the question is, well, what kind of detector do I have, for example, right? And we, we have recently now invested a large amount of money into replacing the detector on our modern microscope because it now can collect really individual electrons. So it counts really every electron. If there's no count, then there was no electron. If there is a count, in this one pixel, then there was really an electron. If there were two counts, then there were two electrons. And this is actually very different from classical detectors where you have readout noise and so on. So I'm saying that because we want to optimize the experimental data acquisition to reduce the noise as much as possible and exclude it from our measurement so that we at the end have data that we can rely, rely on as much as possible. Of course, um, Counting particles, we still have Poisson statistics. We cannot avoid that, but at least there we know how it's behaved, right? So if I to come back to your question, um, which data would I add? I would add data that I can quantify as much as possible, where I know, okay, I can exactly describe my noise properties, um, and then I would prefer this data set over one where, for example, I have unknown readout noise of the detector and so on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question. Uh, thanks for the lecture, first of all. Uh, regarding the back and forward learning of crystal structures, I think it was uh, page 29 or something. Okay. Um, how well are defects and plain defects and such recognized by the, or how good do the samples have to be for the data to, to learn for the model? Yeah, so, so one thing that is indeed an experimental problem is that samples may change under the beam, right? That, that is actually the biggest challenge. That if you acquire, in this case, 25 um, images, and these were all simulated, so we didn't have this problem, but in the real experiment, this becomes a problem, then the samples change. And, um, Let's say, for example, in image 25, we still had 309 atoms. And in image 26, we only have 308 atoms. Then something has changed and the whole model breaks down. Right? That, that is indeed a problem. So atoms move. And that is, um, yeah. With our new techniques, we collect more of the data. That means we're more efficient in recording. That means we don't need so many as many electrons anymore per atom to recover its position. Um, so that's why we hope we can ultimately tackle this problem and really get there. But yeah, the sample quality is indeed an issue and it's not completely solved yet. Otherwise I wouldn't present you simulated data. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. It was, it was fun preparing the lecture. <laughs> Thank you a lot, Christoph, for the, for the very interesting lecture. Yeah, th thank you very much, actually. Interesting and very clear, uh, very nice.